So this weekend, the uh, Dublin International Film Festival is on. There's loads of great stuff. I would wholeheartedly recommend trying to get tickets for Pray For Our Sinners. But one of the other films that we wanted to talk about is about the Debenhams strike. It's called 406 Days, The Debenhams Picket Line. And I'm delighted to say filmmaker Fergus Dowd is with us. We also have with us Carol Ann Bridgerman, who is uh, in the film. Fergus, good morning to you first. How are you? How's it going? Yeah, pretty good. Nice for having me on. No worries. So um, uh, I would have passed this picket line cycling into work uh, in hail, rain and snow over a long period of time and couldn't but have been impressed by the fact that they were there every single day, no matter what. So um, first off, how, what's your involvement with this? How did you end up making a movie about it? Uh, well, I suppose, uh, just to begin, I'm actually an IT systems analyst by trade, but uh, what happened was, um, like many people, during the pandemic, I was sitting in my kitchen or in my front room or upstairs uh, working and a lot of time on my hands, wasn't, wasn't commuting. So uh, just a chap in England, I worked on the Patrick O'Connell stories, the Irish man who saved FC Barcelona. And um, one of the lads in England asked me, would I write a historical piece uh, just for a, a publication in England? And um, I decided in my wisdom to uh, write about a man called Thomas Blackstock. Uh, he died on a football pitch uh, playing for Manchester United uh, in about 1906. Um, he was playing a, a, a reserve team match against St. Helens, uh, went up to head the ball. It was actually in Bank Street, which is the ground before Old Trafford that Manchester United played at. But um, quite innocuous, uh, uh, he fell, collapsed, brought it into the dressing room and passed away. And uh, basically, uh, the coroner in Manchester said it was accidental death. Manchester United didn't pay out any insurance. So his family didn't get a penny. And uh, what, it, what it led to was the formation of the Players Football Union, the PFA, uh, which is their headquarters are in Manchester, uh, led by, today led by Gordon Taylor. But... Um, Two players, Charlie Roberts and Billy Meredith, they formed the, the Players' Union uh, from this incident. Uh, Manchester United were known as the outcasts. Uh, the team was actually banned from playing football. And um, I suppose I'd also intertwined a bit of O'Connell in that when he went back to Spain in 1940, um, the, the supporters of Real Betis that had won the league, you know, that had watched him win the league in 1935, this was his second stint at, 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 in Seville at Betis. Uh, they were in a concentration camp 100 yards down the road. So I wanted to intertwine that with a with a modern-day strike, uh, all that stuff. And um, I just happened to come across the Debenham strikers on social media, a lady called Suzanne Sherry. As you say, th their um, strike began on the 9th of April 2020 when they were sent a generic email and lasted to the 21st of May uh, 2021. But um, she put me in, I just happened to mention to her, look, is there anybody on the strike who lives near Fitzroy Avenue where Patrick O'Connell grew up? And there was a lady called Linda Carroll. I'd never spoken to Linda before. I didn't know her from Adam. Uh, I just gave her a buzz. And um, uh, basically, she was in her 60s. She was a grandmother. I couldn't go down the road two kilometres or five kilometres or whatever it was back then. And um, she was getting up to walk down the road to Henry Street. Uh, to sit on a picket line for six to 12 hours in the middle of a pandemic. She was 62 years of age. Um, but she had this incredible story. Her grandfather was a man called Christopher Duffy. He was shot in the neck on the railway end in Bloody Sunday, 1920. Um, and uh, But he survived and he went on to uh, win two Leicester championships with Dublin. So I basically... I couldn't believe this when I spoke to her and I intertwined her story. It was published. It was published in England. It was pushed by Pogba Gall and in Spain as well because it was obviously a Connor League. And I just happened to say to her at the end, um, you know, can I, uh, you know, is anybody documenting your stories? And so before the film, we wrote a book called Tales from the Devon's Picket Line. And um, I suppose what I did was we just took six stories. I mean, uh, there was Linda's story. There was there was uh, Carol Ann's who was, who, uh, was, was the only picketer to go to the high court. Um, and also uh, there was a young lady called Amy Hurrigan. Uh, they received a generic email just completely out of the blue in the middle of the pandemic to tell them their jobs were gone. She was painting the front room of her house with her mother. She just bought a house. Paul Quinn, whose uh, a brother had uh, introduced Dolores O'Reardon to the Cranberries, he was sitting in a hut for four hundred and six days. His father was the former Lord Mayor of Limerick. And then, so you had all these different stories. Jane Crow, who's the shop steward at Henry Street, she had ended up in ICU. She nearly died from the wear and tear of the strike. So we just put those stories together and I worked with Sue O'Connell who had written a book about, she's a relation of Patrick's uh, in Manchester and um, she had written the book, The Man Who Saved FC Barcelona. So she was used to books. I'd never written a book in my life. You know, I'm used to programming. Um, so uh, we just, we looked at the history of Debenhams and obviously it went back to before the French Revolution 
and also um, the demise of the company. But also what we did was we got videos like from footballers, fans and all that. And so we got them to see if we could speak to them. They did a page each, um, you know, about why they supported the strike. And then we got Suzanne Cherry, who had initially contacted to write about her last um, her last day on the picket sort of to finish the book. But the book did very well. It's all out two print runs. Ollie Campbell launched it in Dublin, the former Irish out half. And um, uh, Sean Ogle helped in and Daryl Canada uh, launched it in Cork and Kerry. Um, and I suppose how the film came about was that um, I w- it was actually Carol Ann after the book. She said to me, look, is there any, um, uh, you know, the book has done well. Is there any chance maybe we could do a film? We actually laughed about it. And um, I got on to Cormac Hardigan, who produced the John Giles documentary for RTE. And then um, he uh, sort of racked his brains for about 20 minutes and then said, oh, there was a guy called Joe Lee who won the best documentary in 2016 uh, with a film called Fortune's Wheel at the Dublin International Film Festival, which is about a lion tamer in Dublin in the 50s. This lion escapes in Fairview. Oh, yeah. Uh, true story. And um, so basically, um, yeah, we uh, went to Buzzwell's, uh, had a coffee. And uh, a year later, we have a film in the International Film Festival. There you go. And uh, selling, speaking of selling out, two of them, uh, two of the screenings have sold out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're hoping to uh, to uh, follow Mr. Meskel, who was on last week. So mm-hmm. we sold out two screens, and I think the third screen is nearly uh, nearly sold out. But um, yeah, we've had fantastic support from the, I suppose, the, the sport more than like, we had Noel Quinn over in Moyle Park there. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we presented a, a painting of Brother Walford, um, which was donated to raise funds for the film. Um, you know, we've we've had the, the women sign the Bohemians jersey, which is which is quite a funny story. We went up to Daly Mount Park and um, we were uh, we, we brought them up to Daly Mount because they're standing in a loading bay. It's freezing. It's yeah. awful. No toilet facilities, nothing. And um, we actually met PJ Gallagher up there, and he presented a short to the women. And that short went to Duncan Edwards Museum. Very good. And then a friend of mine. From Kildare, Brendan Owens, he um, he donated a Celtic jersey which his friend had worn um, at the uh, World Cup 1990. All the matches uh, that was signed by the workers, and that's in the at the Peña Betica, which is the oldest uh, uh, sports club, Real Betis. Uh, they're just in the bells of the Estadio Benito Villa Marin. Right. So that short's over there as well. So um, uh, yeah, Car- it's been fantastic. Caroline, tell us, tell us your where did the idea of a film come from first? What way? Um. Do you know what? Do you know what? Now? It was a case of, I mean, the book was fantastic and it chronicled all the stories, but there was so much footage that we had taken throughout the industrial action on each and every picket line. Plus, we'd done conjoint efforts between all 11 stores. So we had done TikToks, we had done videos, we had compilations of a lot of photographs and things that had happened, funny story, funny stories that um, and funny things that had happened at the picket lines. So there was a it was a, it was a lot. There was a lot involved. So this, the book only told the story of a few workers, whereas the documentary in film would tell the story of many of the workers. So it was I think it was inevitable to carry on from the book to a film. I- Tell us your story, because you just mentioned in passing there that you ended up in the High Court. Um, yes, um, like that, I got involved in the industrial action from the off. Um, I mean, obviously, I lost my job along with nearly a thousand other workers. Um, and as time went on, we staged a sitting um, in Patrick Street, in the, the Patrick Street store. There was eight of us, so we'd done an occupation and... Following from the occupation, they decided that they would take an injunction against me. I'm really sorry. Page. I'm really sorry to interrupt, right? Because <laughs> that's incredible. But I just need to understand exactly what that means, right? So you you get a letter or an email saying, right, Debenhams, no thanks, thanks for all your work, but actually this is now a, a, an administration or a liquidation or whatever the official language was. How do you how do you even get back into the building? Um, well, um, we, we, well, let, let me just hear from Caroline there. Sorry, Fergus. How did you get back into the building? Be, we had to be creative. We found a ladder that was alongside the building that was long enough to reach the, the roof. And there was a window open into the canteen. So we used the ladder to get up onto the roof and in through the window and we occupied the canteen. Wow. <laughs> I can see why a movie was made now. Yeah, whose idea is it to get the ladder as a matter of interest? Like, so something, somebody somewhere is like, I'm not taking this. 
Well, believe it, or, believe it or not, that story is even funnier because there was a man on a bike that had one of these accordion ladders. And when we put the ladder up against it, it didn't quite reach the top. Oh, no. So it was a case of, oh, God. But one of the girls from Tralee looked down and it was just fate. It was meant to be. There was a ladder lying across the, the base of the, the building, which was long enough to reach the top. So... Yeah, that's what we used. It was fairly incredible on the on the morning. Well, what's it like, Caroline? Then going back to the to, to the Ebenhams, to the to the empty buildings for the filming. Um, that must have been quite emotional and, and strange for all of you. It was sad. It was very very sad. I mean, we we went into the one in Patrick Street first, and I mean that's a big landmark in Cork City Centre, and it's always been vibrant. It's always been busy. And then when we went in and it was literally just a shell, it was bare, it was empty. You could hear your the echo of your own voice inside there. And it was sad that such a monumental building was empty and there was nothing. Not, I mean, we always worked in vibrant stores. There was great atmospheres, but it was just dead inside there. And it was just so sad and it was just a pity, really. What's it like being in court against the might of a, a massive organisation? Daunting. Um, like that is something that I personally wouldn't have expected. Um, but it was, I mean, it was a difficult road to even go, take the decision to go up there. And I mean, like that KPMG are a big God almighty corporation that have, I mean, the power and the means at their disposal, which is something that us as the workers didn't have. And there was always a big fear going up there that, I mean, you get a criminal record that the court costs would be appropriated to yourself. Um, and I mean, like that, I'm just an ordinary worker. I lost my way I could have paid court fees. Um, and it was... It was it was certainly enlightening when I went up there because you I think I went up there expecting that my voice would be heard, <clears throat> that I would be the voice of the workers, and unfortunately that's not the way the system works. You don't get much say in the court, and it was it was hard to it was a hard decision to make to go to the court, but it was an even harder feeling after nowhere you didn't get heard the workers voices weren't heard in the court we just having a little bit of difficulty with your line there caroline so i might go back to you fergus for this one um uh, ultimately this is a story that ends i i, I don't know is it a story that ends well but it, it like it's a heroic story of a bunch primarily of, of women there are some men obviously but who decide that they're mad as hell and they're not going to take it anymore yeah, I mean, I'd say it's it's ninety five percent women uh, workforce. Um, I mean, I think the sad thing here is, and and how this all worked worked and how it happened really was that, you know, on the in on the ninth of April two thousand and nineteen, Devon's was restructured in the UK, and what happened was is the the lenders took over the organisation. The lenders were Three Hedge Funds, Barclays Bank, and Bank of Ireland, and what they did was they took out a two hundred million floating charge loan, um, and that date is key because. Um, and what they did was basically they they put that loan against um, the the Debenhams, the subsidiaries Debenhams Ireland, uh, the Irish Debenhams, and the Danish Debenhams. Now, in January 30th, 2020, the Danish uh, organisation were released from the loan because there was interest from a German uh, retail company in buying uh, the Danish outfit. Uh, at the same time, Debenhams in Ireland didn't renew any of their trademarks in the Republic of Ireland. They had 36 trademarks. Um, but on the ninth, in Irish company law, um, you cannot um, liquidate a company. You can't. A floating charge doesn't come, is invalid in any liquidation for t exactly twelve months. So on the 9th of April, twenty twenty, to the day, a year to the day that the floating charge is signed off by the by the Slane Group, that's their name. Um, the Irish side is liquidated. So the debt, they had a debt of twenty two million, which isn't a, much of a debt for eleven stores. So the debt goes from 22 million to uh, 300 million. So the company is liquidated. So we believe it was a tactical liquidation. 
and that the you know the, there's the government should be looking into these things. Obviously, the Duffy Cat report is still sitting on some minister's desk, uh, gathering dust. But I think the sad thing here as well is, as you say, it's women. Um, you know, it's very much a human interest story. The film is told through their eyes and what they had to experience. Um, and, you know, it's completely inhumane conditions. There's no toilet facilities. It's the goodness of the people that live in the areas. You know, they, they bring them over coffee. They, they say to them, do you want to come over and use our toilets? There's, in Henry Street, there was a guy up the road, a, a Chinese, and he used to bring them down breakfast on a Sunday morning. They had Chinese for breakfast on a Sunday morning. You know, stories like that. And I think the, the two key things with this film was that the reason why we had to make it so quickly and within a year, one, it was still raw in the people's heads that are involved in the story. And obviously, the, all the shop stewards were, you know, worked on this film in very much consultative roles. But the second thing was that we also had to get into buildings, you know, the film. Um, and I think at this stage, I must know every property management company in Ireland. Um, but lucky enough, Debenhams didn't own the buildings in Ireland. It was uh, Rota Stores that owned the buildings. So we were also able to bring the workers in to fill them. And, um, and obviously that was very emotional. But um, as I say, you know, it's um, it's very much a, a um, you know, I think on Saturday night at 8 o'clock when people sit down to watch this, there will be sadness, anger, but there will also be pride. And I think they're very much an inspirational yeah. group and they've been fantastic to work with. The, Caroline, the, 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 like, so we hear there the level of sacrifice and, and uh, so we had derogations travelling to work and, and it was literally in the middle of the pandemic. You wouldn't see anybody, but you'd see people at the back of the Henry Street store on, on Parnell Street blocking the loading bay and every, every day you're like, Jesus, that, that, they're still going. It's incredible. But the sacrifice was real. Like you missed your kids' first day at school. Yes, I mean, like that, there was massive sacrifices across all the different stores. And I mean, during the pandemic, people lost loved ones and they were back on the picket the following week. And I mean, like that, they were, no, thankfully, there was very, there was little or no cases of COVID on any of the pickets throughout, which was something incredible because we all maintained our own personal safety and the safety of everyone else around us. But yeah, there was a lot of sacrifices. I mean, like that, your phone was going constantly when there was a red alert, you drop everything and you go run into your store and um, you could be down there for several hours at a time. Um, like that, it was just constant. Your phone didn't stop. There was meeting, there was meetings, there was time on that picket. And uh, I mean, we were there, rain, hail, snow. We were there coming up to Christmas and it was like it was never going to end. We were never getting the consultation between between the union, between KPMG. We were just never get, we were never getting a break. And like that, the personal sacrifices for everyone. I mean, like you said, I missed my child, my youngest daughter's first day um, attending primary school because of I was in the occupation. The day I was up in court was my the anniversary of my father, my father's death. So, I mean, that was just my story. But there was many, many more like that, that they had immense sacrifices within their own families and their own lives in order to maintain those pickets. I mean, Fergus spoke of Lindo Carl. I mean, Lindo Carl was getting up at five o'clock in the morning, every morning and traveling in all weather conditions to get into the picket on Henry Street. And that was the same case in many, many of the work with many, many of the workers. Well, listen, you, you did uh, a, a great piece of work, not just for the people who work at Devon, but for everybody who comes after you. I'm really looking forward to seeing the film. Hopefully there are some tickets left for that third screening. My thanks to Fergus Dowd and to Caroline Bridgman. The film is called 406 Days, The Debenhams Picket Line, and it's uh, on in the Dublin International Film Festival, and I presume it'll be on our TV screens at some point soon uh, as well.